presented by AT&T 5G. One more week to make a playoff case. Championship weekend is looming. It's easy to think four teams are shoe-ins. Well, last weekend taught us just how quickly the shoe can be thrown to the other foot. Alabama and Notre Dame might have left footprints that are large enough that it really doesn't matter what they do this weekend. Ohio State and Clemson probably only have to avoid stubbing their toes. But the rest, lace them up tight. Spoilers are looming. Their sole mission, take a championship and maybe find a way to sneak into that playoff field if the shoe fits. The season we never expected is nearing an end. So they have just one more week to earn a win and find a place to appreciate through promise and pain. No good! Florida is upset by LSU. The power of a word we so often overlook. Now. That's all we have, and it's what they've earned. For all they've fought against to have this second in time to know how they rank and where they stand. Notre Dame knocks off number one. They may yet rise and fall, advance and recede. But in this instant, they've made it far enough to be counted and graded and placed. Touchdown! They've made it to the only place any of us can really claim, and all of us should cherish. Now. Earlier today in Grapevine, Texas, College Football Playoff Selection Committee getting together. Gary Barta, the chair, will join us a little later on to answer questions. One question was answered for itself on Saturday night when Florida did the face plant against LSU and greatly jeopardized their opportunity to earn their way into the college football playoff by beating Alabama in the SEC championship game. Glad to have you with us. College football playoff top 25. These are the last rankings before the ones come out on Sunday. Exclusively noon Eastern time here on ESPN. You'll see them as soon as we do. Then we'll know who's going to be in the college football playoff. Joined as always by my partners Kirk Herbstreit. David Pollock, Jesse Palmer, and Joey Galloway. So as we get started, let's look at the storylines going in to these penultimate rankings ones right before the final ones. In the SEC, it'll be Alabama and Florida again. Crimson Tide took care of business. The Gators did not. You've seen the shoe throw. Game was lost well before the shoe throw, probably in practice during the week. The Gators put themselves in jeopardy. Rematch in the ACC. We're going to tell you how rare it is for a team to sweep and how rare it is for the second rematch of top five teams to be even close. Clemson and Notre Dame for the ACC championship. And in the Big Ten, Ohio State is in. Only had to play five games to get there. Northwestern is probably kicking itself. Had they not stumbled against Michigan State, they probably would be in a position to earn their way in to the college football playoff field. So, Kirk, what are you looking forward to seeing in these rankings? Where we expect the top five will be the same. Yeah, I think we all agreed, obviously, the top five is going to be the same without any big shakeups from last weekend. I think it's, it's a little bit further down. You know, it's, it's storylines like Coastal Carolina trying to narrow the gap on Cincinnati. It's uh, where's Iowa State? You know, they made a big jump last week. What happens to Iowa State this week if there's chaos ahead of them this weekend? And I think even USC, the Pac-12, you know, we, we talked about that a little bit on game day last week. Just the fact that they, it's not pretty, but they continue to find ways to win games. I'm anxious to see what the committee thinks of, uh, of Clay Helton's bunch after last weekend. Now, we're going to talk about that a little bit later on after rankings are revealed. Obviously, we haven't seen them. But now we can. College football playoff. When they don't play, other teams don't. Let's see who's at number eight. Cincinnati will have a chance in the American Championship game. And Georgia, despite losing its two most important games this year, committee loves the Bulldogs. I mean, that's certainly in Alabama's favor. It might give Alabama some leeway in the SEC Championship game since the Crimson Tide handled the Bulldogs to these in the regular season. And Florida also beat Georgia. Let's look at number seven just ahead of Georgia at seven is it is Florida now that was a terrible loss against LSU are did you think the Gators would fall farther a uh, Joey I absolutely did and Reese this entire time was we once we got into that top 10 I kept thinking where the heck is Florida 
Florida sitting at number seven, they still got a shot at this thing. I assume with losing to a, a three and five LSU team that had looked terrible, lost by a million points to Alabama, beating Florida. I thought Florida would be much lower than this, but sitting at seven, they knock off Alabama. We got a discussion on Sunday. All right, so we have Florida at number seven. Kirk, I thought they would fall a little bit farther, too. I did think that the floor for them had to be one spot above Georgia, which is where they are right now. Uh, you know, I've said about Ohio State leading up to this that you can't give them everything. Same holds true for Florida. Just because they played more games, you can't lose a game like that and still be in contention for the playoffs. But even if you win the SEC, can you? Well, I think it's how they lost that game, right? I, I think it was a home game and a game. It's, it's college football. It's emotions. They, they looked at the film. They, they thought LSU would just walk in there. LSU had opt-outs. They had everything going against them. And, and to be candid, I think Florida just kind of, I don't want to say they just showed up, but the way the game went and the way they have looked in recent weeks, that was not the Florida team we've seen. I, they must be peeking ahead to Atlanta and start, start thinking about uh, getting ready for Alabama. They'll be a very different team Saturday, obviously, when they play Bama. But there should be a penalty uh, no to doubt. me. I, I'm surprised that they only dropped one spot to number seven. And as Joey said, uh, they're, they're still, you know, if, if there's some, some – if they win and – you know, I don't know if winning is enough. I, that would be a great discussion tonight. Is winning enough now that we know they're at seven? Would that be enough? If they would have beaten LSU, Jesse, it would be a, a given. Now, I don't know, but uh, dropping one spot, I think a lot of people are scratching it, their heads. It, well, if they beat number one Alabama in the SEC title game, it, it becomes an interesting discussion simply because – an SEC champion has never been left out of the college football playoff in six years. Of course, a two-loss team has never been let in. So, it, really interesting. If they could, the, the way the Gators' defense is played, it doesn't look uh, like they're capable of beating Bama. They'll certainly have to show up uh, uh, and, and be ready to go much more than they were this past weekend. That's for sure. You know, I don't think a two-loss team should be disqualified simply because of the number of losses. But if it comes against a team. No that's played the way LSU has, that's a bad loss. You have to be penalized for it. And up to this point, I'm not sure that, uh, look, final rankings, maybe they can't, maybe they can't uh, jump the divide and make it into the playoff. But that's a, that's a tough one to swallow. I think if they beat Alabama, the best case scenario for them is like Penn State a few years ago. They had the win over Ohio State. Ohio State still ended up going to the playoff. All right, let's look at the top of the latest college football playoff rankings. My producer, Calf Man, says the most dramatic way to do this is to start Start at the top and then we'll show you where we change at number one we anticipate that Alabama will remain there the Crimson Tide ran the table in the regular season in the SEC they are 10 and 0 at number two has to be Notre Dame right fighting Irish also 10 and 0 off last week as they prepare for the rematch in the ACC title game that Kirk and Chris Fowler will call on Saturday afternoon from Charlotte College game day will be there against Clemson who I assume is going to be number three is that correct it is Dabo Swindy's Tigers holding firm at number three so now we've got one two three you've got an Ohio State team that's only played five games you got Iowa State that we haven't seen and you got Texas A&M who's also had a little bit of time off due to the coronavirus so let's look at number six Iowa State, despite the loss to Louisiana, who has a better record, the Raging Cajuns with a 17-point victory over Iowa State in the opener. We like to say every game counts. Apparently, that one has been mitigated. At number five, one spot ahead of Iowa State, is Texas A&M. The Aggies also have only played eight games. They play Tennessee this weekend be one game on their schedule that they were unable to make up so hanging in at number four is Ohio State half the number of games of the three teams ranked in front of them and fewer games than the two teams directly behind them but an opportunity to win the Big Ten championship to have a couple of quality wins among their six if they're able to beat Northwestern by beating Indiana and the Wildcats and seemingly only a win away from making it into the college football playoffs. So what's your reaction to, to what you see, Kirk? I think what you just said, the fact, if Ohio State was going to drop down because of number of games, it would have been last week or this week. The reality is what it is with Ohio State, with everything that's gone on, the fact that they are sitting there at 5-0, and they're able to play this weekend in Indianapolis against Pat Fitzgerald and Northwestern. If they were to win that game and be crowned Big Ten champion, 
they're playing. They're 60 minutes away, whether you agree with it or disagree with it. They're 60 minutes away from making it into the playoff. The, 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 the question to me, David, is the other games, the game in Charlotte. What will be the results of Notre Dame and Clemson and what that potentially could do if it all – I mean, I've heard Davo Sweeney say if Clemson loses, they're still good, that they should be in even with two losses. Uh, I think we all agree that if, it's, that, that if Notre Dame uh, were to lose, that both of those teams would probably be in. So I, I think uh, – I know you love chaos. You like Armageddon. What do, you, what do you think of what we have, and what, what's your favorite Armageddon situation coming up next weekend? I do love some chaos. Um, I think if you have Notre Dame beat Clemson, <laughs> let's let the fun begin. I mean, I think it would be outstanding um, just to see what happens next because, you know, four out of the last six years, number five has made it into the college football playoff. It's not a horrible spot to be in if you're Texas A&M. So, you know, listen, I, I think that Notre Dame, how they lose will be interesting to see how they judge if they lost. But Clemson losing throws in a scenario where it would just be fun. There'd be a lot of discussion, and it's going to be a lot of if, ands, or buts, and what you like best, Joey. It, it gets interesting to me, Kirk, and you mentioned that Dabo said, you know, thinks that they should be in even if they lose. Well, if you look at Florida's situation, and Florida just fell one spot and losing to a three-win LSU team, if Clemson goes on and loses to Notre Dame, which is number two in the country for a second time, gives them two losses, why would they assume that they're going to fall more than one spot, which is exactly what Florida did? The other side of it, if I'm Cincinnati, I'm really upset right now. I'm really not happy about the fact that we were, we fallen a spot each week after not playing. And it's not their fault. And so as we have all these discussions about teams not playing versus teams playing versus teams playing five games, how many games you get in, it seems as if some teams are being punished for not playing football games and some teams are not. And so if I'm one of the little guys, if I'm Cincinnati and I'm always scratching and clawing to be considered one of the big boys, I look at this and what's going on and say, look, this is not fair. We're being punished for not playing and it's not our fault. Joey, I, I, I think my biggest takeaway from this past weekend was that two spots are now taken. Bam has been number one, every ranking coming out after beating Arkansas. Uh, they're going to get in no matter what, even if they lose to Florida. You're not, they're not going to move them off the number one spot outside the top four, even with a loss against the Gators. And I think with the Gators losing to LSU, that really helped out Notre Dame. Uh, last week, I thought that if a situation came up where a one loss Florida would have beaten Alabama and Ohio State looked really good in their Big Ten title game against Northwestern. If Clemson blew Notre Dame out, there was a chance maybe the Irish would drop out of the top four. But after UNC pummeled then number 10 Miami this past weekend and the Gators lost against LSU, you take a look, Kirk, at Notre Dame's resume right now. Those wins against Clemson and against UNC, that's really impressive in the committee's eyes. And even if they were to lose and maybe even lose by 20 plus points against Clemson this upcoming weekend. I still think, Kirk, their resume stacks up well against what could be a 6-0 Big Ten champion, Ohio State, or even an 8-1 Texas A&M. You know, one thing I just wanted to add real quick before Reese uh, hops back in, I, I just wanted to say that if, if whether it's, it's right or wrong, there's a perception with Alabama, Clemson, and Ohio State that, that they are the better teams and better programs in college football. And if, if the shoe were on the other foot, and Alabama, let's say, played five games, or Clemson played five games, and the five games that they played, they looked dominant. And then they were going to go off into their conference championship and, and, and go have a chance to win their conference and play six games. I would guarantee you that they would be facing the same situation that Ohio State is facing. So you can say that's unfair. The committee's trying to put the best four teams in the playoff. And, and that's where this subjective analysis, I think, is, is, is very frustrating for a lot of people. I don't want to say it's a different set of rules, but it's a different perception based on the equity that Alabama and Nick Saban, what Urban Meyer and now Ryan Day has done at Ohio State, and what Dabo Sweeney has created at Clemson. Because Ohio State was 1-0, and Reese, and the AP had them at number three in the country. So there's a, a consensus that they're an elite team. It just comes down to the amount of games. But if Clemson and Alabama had that same scenario, they would also be getting that benefit. Yes. That's true, but that's not, those aren't mutually exclusive. That, that, there's no false dilemma there. They would be getting that benefit, but it would also be fair to question them. And, and I'll go ahead and say it, there is a different set of rules. Now, maybe 
because those teams are so good and pass the test, the eye test, or the football judgment test, or whatever you want to call it. Maybe that's as it should be. But I, I think I think the thing beyond Ohio State, who I've had ranked number three in the AP poll and still do, and I think they can they can win the national championship. I think the thing below it is what Joey's talking about. I think the frustrating thing is Cincinnati slipping and, and the infatuation with Iowa State, which is a really good team, but they have a significant blemish to a team that is also ranked well below them with a better record who, you know, haven't looked as good at times as others. But all those things that we'll get into with Gary Barta, also talk about why Ohio State looks one way and USC looks another with a similar number of games, although I do think that's appropriate. This is what we're looking forward to in Charlotte this weekend. I love this show. I get to get on a soapbox and nobody can tell me to stop talking. Tigers and Irish part two coming up from Charlotte, the ACC championship game and the chairman of the college football playoff selection committee, Gary Barta. We have the latest top six from the college football playoff selection committee. Top four remains the same. Top five remains the same. Iowa State has moved into number six. Cyclones playing for the Big 12 championship and maybe with a puncher's chance to sneak in, Florida just behind at number seven as we are joined by the chairman of the College Football Playoff Selection Committee, Gary Barta, also the athletic director at Iowa. Gary, let's start uh, where a lot of the discussion has centered the last couple of weeks with Ohio State. In the committee's judgment, why has Ohio State, and really even Texas A&M, though they haven't missed uh, as many games as, as Ohio State, why have those two been able to hold their positions and team like, teams like Cincinnati have slipped in the standings? This week is uh, certainly unique, Reese, in that uh, 12 of the 25 teams ranked did not play. And, and in the top six, five of those teams didn't play. So when it comes to uh, uh, Ohio State and, and Texas A&M, there was some discussion uh, in that one through five, but uh, really not a lot of discussion of moving anybody. Uh, when it comes to uh, Cincinnati, you know, the committee has, uh, has shown appreciation for Cincinnati from, from the beginning. We haven't had a chance to watch them play since November 21st. Uh, and the teams around them, the teams ahead of them, have played two or three games that we've been able to evaluate. And one of the things that holds Cincinnati back, again, a great team, they don't have a win against a, a top 25. So, the, the teams, Iowa State was idle, Cincinnati was idle, uh, a lot of teams in that top 10 that didn't play this week, uh, which created some challenges in evaluation, but not, not a lot of movement. Understanding, and I agree with, a head-to-head -head result, particularly early in the season, can't be the be-all, end-all. But there's a pretty wide gap between how the committee is ranking Iowa State and the team that they lost to, Louisiana. Um, how would you describe uh, the reasons for that? Why is there such a gap between those two when Louisiana, granted from a smaller conference, probably not the same overall schedule, but they beat them decisively and, and they have a better record? Yeah, when, when you look at Iowa State, uh, one of the things that, that happened along the way, they beat uh, a, a, a highly ranked Oklahoma team. They also beat uh, 20th ranked Texas. Uh, they're leading the Big 12. Uh, the, the committee... Uh, kept watching that, that defense and that offense improve. Uh, they have the leading rusher in the country. And so, and so the, the appreciation for Iowa State uh, is, is related to that. Uh, as it relates to uh, Louisiana, a, a terrific team, they did beat Iowa State. And, uh, you know, the committee certainly gives them credit for that. Uh, they, their loss was to Coastal Carolina. Uh, they, they'll have an opportunity to play Coastal again in the Sun Belt, two really good Sun Belt teams. But what Iowa State has done since that loss, uh, it's more to say, it, it says more about that than it does about Louisiana's play. I think that most, most everyone that looks at this objectively would say the top four teams that you have are the four best teams. They are the four most powerful teams. And while Ohio State hasn't had as many opportunities, they've looked, they've looked terrific when they've played. But if there are upsets this weekend, how would you describe the opportunity for an undefeated Cincinnati or an undefeated Coastal Carolina uh, with solid, a couple solid wins on the resume? And Cincinnati would get a victory over a team that's currently ranked if they beat Tulsa. How would you describe the gap that they would have to cover to be able to make it into the playoff as opposed to just a New Year's Six game? Well, we have 10 championships coming up. I hope uh, we get an opportunity to play all of them because is uh, always the case. Uh, it's, it's ranked teams against ranked teams. And so we're going to have 10 new games, 
to put into the mix and to evaluate. I'm, I'm not going to speculate on, on how it all might come out, but, but this is a weekend. One of the reasons that it, it's so exciting is we get to see 10 matchups against teams, uh, all of whom are, are ranked. I think all of them are ranked, and uh, it should be an exciting weekend. Based on, uh, based on the discussion in the committee room, Gary, the two, te two teams at the top, Alabama and Notre Dame, um, are they viewed as being, maybe along with Clemson, are those teams viewed as being significantly ahead, both in accomplishment and in football judgment, um, where they might have some leeway this weekend? Alabama is undefeated. I, I mentioned earlier uh, in the top six, there was only one team that played this week. Uh, you know, they, they beat Arkansas 52 to three. Uh, offense, defense, special teams. They're, you know, they, they're just uh, from top to bottom. They're, they're a fantastic team. Notre Dame also undefeated. And, uh, you know, their defense has, has uh, really impressed the committee. The Ian Book uh, got better and better as the year went along. And so watching the ACC championship, watching that game uh, between Notre Dame and Clemson, uh, I know I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm sure the committee is as well. And we're certainly looking forward to it as well, Gary. I'm also looking forward to chatting with you on Sunday when the final college football playoff selection committee rankings come out. We find out which four teams make it into the college football playoff. Always a pleasure, my friend. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. All right, there is Gary Barta, who is put in the difficult situation to answer those questions for the 13 committee members who get together and come up with these rankings. And it's not done in a traditional form where you just list 1 through 25. They vote for them in groups, and sometimes that creates a little bit of movement. Probably have seen a result of that with Cincinnati's slip the last couple of weeks. Now, as you know, the college football playoff semifinals are scheduled to be played on New Year's Day in the Rose Bowls and the Sugar Bowls. Now, in the Sugar Bowl, you'll be able to have fans. That is not the case right now in the Rose Bowl. And just a little while ago, the executive director of the college football playoff, Mr. Bill Hancock, issued this statement. He says, at this moment, college football playoff looks forward to playing one of the two semifinal playoff games at the Rose Bowl as scheduled. As we move forward with our planning, we continue to hope that the Rose Bowls appeal to government officials to allow the families of student athletes to attend will be permitted. Just as student athlete families will be welcomed at the Sugar Bowl, the other New Year's Six games and the championship game in Miami. Statement goes on to read this way. Given the vast space inside the Rose Bowl Stadium, we are confident that if families were able to attend, they could do so in a safe and socially distant manner. For many families, this will be the last chance they have to see their sons play college football. We understand that under California's COVID-19 protocols, fans in general will not be able to attend. We hope the small number of families who want to attend will not be prohibited from doing so. That is the end of the statement. Very important, perhaps, to note the first phrase in this statement at this moment. Tigers and Irish Part 2. ACC Championship game coming up in Charlotte. A little historical perspective when you come back. Coronavirus. This type of rematch really hasn't seen very often since the AP Polo era started in 1936. Just a fourth time. The previous three. First game close. Second game, the loser won in a blowout. No teams have met three team times in a single season since 1909. Now the stage could be set for that if Clemson were to win and both Clemson and Notre Dame make it into the playoff. We know this on Saturday, a great showdown between quarterbacks. Kirk, talk to both of them. To be honest, almost nationally an eye roll when people bring up a Notre Dame. Like, ah, oh, you know, they're overrated. Oh, did the players feel that? We talk about it a lot. I mean, it's a lot of noise outside of our building that you know we can't control. But before we were in a conference, it's you got to win every game if you want to go to the playoff. You know, there's no no if ands or buts about that. I kind of like it, and I think our team likes it. Just use it, use that as fuel. You know, and we got to win every game. We want to win every game, and we believe that we can compete and uh, make it to the playoffs and go win a national championship. For a team that likes a chip on their shoulder, that's got to be cranking right now this week. It's just a good reminder. You know, we're not guaranteed to win uh, you really just have to take it week by week and you gotta you gotta get, give it everything you have every week you can't take a week off what a game it's going to be on abc saturday four o'clock eastern time clemson and notre dame acc championship playoff berth 
I believe potentially the Heisman Trophy uh, could be influenced greatly. If not, the leader emerged from that game. Trevor Lawrence maybe making a late surge or Ian Book that David has advocated for 4 o'clock Eastern time. Tigers and the Fighting Irish for the second time this year. The Pac-12 championship game, a little bit unusual. Washington can't play because of COVID protocol, so it'll be Oregon taking on undefeated USC. The Trojans up to number 13 in the latest playoff rankings, but not getting near the type of respect that Ohio State does. Here's SC Athletic Director Mike Bolt. Well, obviously, I think their brand and their recent performance certainly helps them immensely. I mean, coming to SC after spending six years in the state of Ohio at the University of Cincinnati, I get a good sense of, of what uh, their prowess is and and the way they've accomplished so many different things. So, you know, I've, my hat's off to them. I've competed against them uh, uh, in from numerous institutions, and I understand that. I think that's why Friday's a big opportunity for us. I really do. I mean, when you start comparing some of the different power indexes and so forth, you know, we'll see how that shakes out. But our focus right now is on Friday. And that's exactly where it should be, as the Trojans can win a Pac-12 championship, and that means something. But for the purpose of our discussion, we talk playoff here. Now, USC has the same record as Ohio State. But in my judgment, they're not close to the same teams. SC's had to pull a couple games out of the fire, one of them against a very poor opponent, the other two against very average opponents. Um, you look at this now, and big brands do get the benefit of the doubt, Kirk, and if USC had been dominant, I think they might have gotten some of the benefit of the doubt that Ohio State has gotten, but they haven't looked the same. Uh, you look at the two teams play, and Ohio State has controlled its games in a far greater manner uh, than the Trojans have. Yeah, you, you know, people bring up eye test, and you can use eye test, or you can actually use metrics. I mean, you can look at the efficiency. It favors Ohio State considerably, is what you just said. Game control favors Ohio State considerably. The strength of schedules is, is in favor of USC. Neither one is great, but the difference is the way Ohio State has played. You know, Ohio State, they've had huge leads on some teams and have allowed teams to come back. And they still are, are up very high as far as game control. So I think that's the biggest difference. That that and Joey, the the, uh, the team that was coming in. You know how you know you're not supposed to look at teams before the season starts. But with the team that Ohio State had last year, and a lot of those players coming back, I think Ohio State had a, a lot of momentum coming into this year. And I don't think they've done necessarily anything to diminish that based on the games that they played in. No, and, and it's always interesting to me, and, and we've always had discussions about, you know, at, at times you don't control your schedule. And, and especially in this season, you had zero control over your schedule. So if you're going to play an Arizona State team that is now sitting at one and two, you can't have tipped passes at the end to find a way to beat them by one point. That was the moment when all of a sudden it was like, uh-oh, USC might not be as good as we thought. And then they play Arizona the next week, who is now sitting at 0 and 5. And it was a four-point victory, again, very close at the end. And then this, la this past weekend, to win the game at the end against an average UCLA team, it just opens your eyes to say, look, you're undefeated, but you haven't made the statements that we needed to see to get you into this conversation. Ohio State has made those statements uh, besides the very close game to Indiana, which was a top-10 team at the time. So the difference is when you watch these two teams play, it's not just the 5-0 and record at the end. It's how you arrived at 5-0 and that has hurt USC. No doubt. Who you've played, who you've beaten is obviously a big stipulation with the committee. Um, I think USC's 5-0 and and their five opponents have a combined seven wins. Um, if you watch the UCLA game last week, I, I, I think if you watch that and they play that game again, you might favor UCLA. So I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a bias. I think it's fair. I, I think – USC, uh, USC on defense, you, you, you question them on defense. On offense, you've had moments where you've questioned them as well. So I think they're a really good football team. I would love to have seen them play more games against competitive folks, but they've played a less than desirable schedule, and they haven't looked great. So that's not something that you're going to say, oh, man, we need to be fighting for them to put them in the top five, put them in the top six. It's not at that point, Jesse. Yeah, David, I think it's just as simple as Ohio State's a better team and they're playing in a better conference. And you guys have alluded to the game control and how dominant they've been. Consider that Ohio State probably played their C-minus game against Indiana, a team the committee has ranked, I think, 11 right now. And they were winning that game 35-7 to before things started getting weird. 
And you guys have talked about how USC has had to come back in three of their games. It's not just us saying this, by the way. The committee in their very first college football playoff ranking had Ohio State at four, and they had USC at number 18. Now, I said at the beginning of the show, it doesn't help USC when you're not playing anybody that's ranked, and that's on the Pac-12. I also think from a committee standpoint, you're not supposed to evaluate what's happened in the past, but I do think in some people's subconscious, they remember seeing USC give up 49 points against Iowa in the Holiday Bowl just this past season, a Big Ten team. So I think all of that plays into why Ohio State is ranked so much higher than USC at this point. Hey, look, I think USC is dangerous on offense. I would have loved to have seen them have that opportunity they originally had scheduled against Alabama in the season opener. And, you know, people say, well, why aren't you giving them credit for the victories? In my estimation, we are because we're having this discussion, right? <laughs> we're having the discussion as to why their record is not giving them the same place uh, that, that Ohio State has attained. And the reason is, is because they won the game. So they're getting credit for it and they deserve it. it. It's not easy to win. And USC has been able to do that without blemish so far. And they have a chance to win a conference championship as well. So what does the bear think? The bear looks stern right now, Herbie. I, I think he's upset uh, with me questioning Iowa State. I love the clones, bear. Blast. We'll see the rankings when you do. We don't get a sneak peek. Some Notes from this latest edition of the rankings, Alabama number one again, but no top ranked team in the penultimate next to last rankings has ever gone on to win the title. Clemson highest ranked one loss team, no two loss team has ever made the 14 playoff and unprecedented stability at the top. Top four, the same four straight weeks. That's the longest stretch of the college football playoff era. And Texas A&M, Iowa State, and Florida just behind as the guys return. And Chris Felica has joined us now. So, Bear, uh, let's start with the team sitting just on the outside. Iowa State at number six, Florida at number seven. If you look at those two teams, I'd probably favor them to beat the group of five contenders, Cincinnati or Coastal Carolina. But is it fair to say that given the setup and the way the committee looks at things, that if you think the group of five team has a chance to get into the playoff, it's probably uh, not not going to happen under this system. No, you, you would you would think that if it would happen in any year, it would be this year with the number of the fact. I think the fact that people have see three two loss power five teams ahead of Cincinnati and Coastal Carolina, that's the problem. I think you can make a great case right. Look, I get why people are outraged at Cincinnati being ranked where they are. I'm more outraged that Cincinnati is ahead of Coastal Carolina right now. I think if you look at Coastal's wins against BYU, Louisiana, Appalachian State, and I know Kansas isn't good, but it's still a Power 5 win, they've got a heck of a lot be- a stronger resume than Cincinnati does right now. And I think you look at the efficiency rate ratings, and and they're kind of comparable. But but I think, I think Iowa State here is a team that a lot of people are really scratching their head about. And look, I get they have two losses, and I get the – they lost by 17 to Louisiana, and there were circumstances in that game. There was a touchdown with 10 seconds left. There were three non-offensive, non-offensive touchdowns in the game. Charlie Kohler didn't play. It did happen, though. But I think people have this assumption that like, Iowa State's like this garbage team. If you go back since Halloween, Iowa State has a higher overall team efficiency rating than Notre Dame does. They're right there with Clemson, like a couple of decimal points behind. The only teams ahead of Iowa State in terms of scoring margin since Halloween are Alabama and Oklahoma. This is not like some like team that's just squeaking by and they really aren't getting... Again, you have to remember they lost to Oklahoma State, they lost to Louisiana. But if you look at their performance later in the year, like Gary Barter was talking about the way they're playing and that they've been dominating teams, that, that's why. That's probably what they're looking at. Bear, usually we throw you in the corner on the game day set. You got a sweatshirt on and a hoodie and now you got the, you got a pocket square, you got the sport coat on the Tuesday night show, you step it up a notch. I just like you're just like you're saying about about Iowa State. I want to throw Oklahoma at you. Um, Oklahoma is a team. I, I happened to see them a few weeks ago against Oklahoma State. And I, I, I called Lincoln after the game and I said, man, I think you're better right now as a complete team than you were last year, the year before, the year before that, because of the way their defense is playing and the way you know, this, this uh, Rattler kid has really grown up. So where they were early in the year, keep in mind, you lose CeeDee Lamb, the best receiver. You lose your top backs. You lose your quarterback, Jalen Hurts. You're breaking in some new offensive linemen. They had big leads on Kansas State. They ended up not being able to hold on. They had a lead against Kansas State, couldn't hold on. They have a chance to avenge that loss to Iowa State. If they were to win and look good doing it, could you say the same thing about Oklahoma, even though they're way down at 10? 
if there's chaos up above them? Why not Oklahoma if you're saying the same it, thing about Iowa State? I, I would agree with you. It, it seemed, just from being a 10, it seems like it would be too high of a jump in my book. But but you're right. And I think one thing that I'm, I'm looking forward to this weekend is, like Oklahoma's defense, like you've talked about, has played better. But you look at the last three opponents. It was Oklahoma State when Spencer Sanders got hurt. It was Baylor. It was Kansas. So now they face a, a, a much more dynamic Iowa State offensive team with Brees Hall and, and Purdy and those receivers room playing better. But but you're right. If, 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 Iowa, if Oklahoma were to pick up a win over the team that the committee is ranking sixth right now, like and they're a conference champ, that, that's ultimately going to – this is the situation we're talking about. The only way this comes into play – is if Clemson were to lose against yeah. Notre Dame. I think everybody's assuming that Clemson's yeah. going to beat Notre Dame and we're not going to be there. But if Clemson were to lose to Notre Dame again, uh, you're looking at a pool of eligible teams. Or, well, not eligible, but you've got the one-loss A&M team who's not a conference champion. You've got a two-loss Clemson team who's not a conference champion. You've got a two-loss Big 12 team uh, who, who's a conference champion. And you've got Cincinnati or a two-loss Florida that's not a conference champion. Or a three-loss Florida, you'd say. They would, be, they would be out of it. So, like, P- P- like it's a weird year, and I, I am curious to see if we do get that uh, second Notre Dame upset of Clemson, what ultimately happens. So two things, Bear. One, Coastal Carolina 100% deserves to be above Cincinnati. I'm sorry. Like, they've, they've played now 11 games. They have at least two better wins than Cincinnati. That needs to be a point that needs to be made for the New Year's Six conversation. And two, we don't even talk about A&M. Like, it's literally like A&M's not even there at five. Are, are, they, are they still five? Am I, is my monitor off? Like, does, does anybody ever even mention A&M? Are they, allowed, are they in the playoff discussion, or do we just need to take them out of the mix? Well, I, I initially yeah. thought that they were kind of a placeholder because I didn't necessarily see LSU's upset win over Florida coming. And, and now that that happened, A&M is in the mix. But I think the one thing to keep in mind with the committee – and I don't know what the conversations are behind uh, the, the, those closed doors in the committee room walls there. Like, the only way a and is going to get in is at number four. And I will likely play Alabama at number one. We saw that game already this year. I don't think we want to see that game again. Would the committee put, like, like does that conversation come up? Do we want to avoid the rematch with, with A&M and Alabama? I don't think it should. I think if the committee feels A&M is the fourth best team in the country, they should make the playoff. But, but, but I, I, think there, I think there would be a conversation like, do we give another team a chance? I, I mean, whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. But, 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 but I think that's an interesting dynamic to see whether, whether we would get that Alabama A&M second meeting this year. Well, Bear, I think one thing that, that the committee's made, made obvious, and they keep talking about it, is the more games you play, the more opportunities you have to impress the committee. And I think that's why we keep seeing teams like Iowa State and Georgia creep up the list. I, I agree with what Bear's saying about Iowa State. They are a much improved team. Teams get better and they get worse. 45 nothing Kansas State, 42-6 to or something against a good West Virginia team. The way they run the ball, their scheme on offense and their defense, and Brock Purdy making better decisions has made them a better-looking team. JT Daniels has been a total difference for Georgia since he's taken over as well. I do agree with Cincinnati still being ranked ahead of Coastal Carolina, though, Joey, and that's just an eye test thing for me. I think both offenses are good. I know Coastal Carolina has a better resume right now, but to me, Cincinnati's defense far superior to what we've seen from Coastal Carolina. So I understand why Cincinnati's upset, out of sight, out of mind, and they're slipping. But I think where they got those two group of five teams right now, I'm okay with. I absolutely agree with you on the Cincinnati thing. I, I don't even think that's close. When we look at Cincinnati and their defense and what Luke Fickle, Mark Spring has done there, their defense might be better than every team ahead of them in the way they play, the different styles they run of their defense with the 3-4 and everything they do. I think they're really good. It's interesting to me, though, uh, Reese, when you are talking to, to Mr. Barda earlier about Iowa State, and he mentioned a win over a highly ranked Oklahoma team. That Oklahoma team was uh, one and two, you know, coming on their second loss after getting, getting beat to, to Kansas State early in the season when Iowa State beat them. So it's always interesting to me how we view these wins and losses by these teams. Uh, how they view a Coastal Carolina that just won on the last second against a Troy team uh, last weekend. It's always interesting how they look at these things, the respect they give some of these teams for wins that may have happened early in a season where we believe that Louisiana State, Louisiana isn't getting the same respect for the win over Iowa State because it's the opening week, but then Iowa State's getting the respect of beating an Oklahoma team that had just lost to Kansas State the week before. So it's all really interesting 
the way the committee looks at these things. Now, let me be clear. Louisiana has escaped a lot uh, in their games, but, you know, they've won the games. Iowa State looks like the much better team right now, but that just seems like a pretty wide gulf. And as for the Cincinnati Coastal discussion, that's important because, remember, the highest-ranked Group of Five champion makes it into a New Year's Six game. That would be something that's out there for both Cincinnati and Coastal Carolina if they were to be champions of their respective conferences. That's the way the top six right now looks. And hey, look, Iowa State's really take a quick look at the All-State playoff predictor. You see the percentage chance of making the playoff. Want to point out the predictor forecast the final playoff selection committee uh, selection based on the committee's past behavior. A little bit of a quirk this year, obviously, with a few number of games being played in some quarters and that was responsible for some of those numbers. Final rankings come out Sunday noon Eastern. We will be here to see them when you do and to debate them as we always have. For Kirk, David, Joey and Jesse and the Barrett Sports Code, I'm Reese. We'll see you later.